Today, we're going to give you three easy and natural ways to improve your nitric oxide. And guess what? We decided, you know what? Maybe we could get somebody who really knows this space. And we did. He knows it a little bit more than we do. He won the Nobel Prize for discovering nitric oxide, Dr. Lou Ignaro. So let's back up just a little bit, though. <clears throat> if you have heard of nitric oxide, you probably heard a lot of wonderful things that it expands your arteries so the blood can flow. But maybe you didn't hear some other things, too, like it even helps decrease plaque. So there's a lot to learn here. Now, <clears throat> when we have enough nitric oxide, our blood vessels relax, they widen, they allow the blood to flow more freely. Well, let's go back and let me tell you a story. You'll get a lot more information in the meeting today about it, but it was a group before 1970 that were led by a very young Dr. Lou Ignaro. He and his colleagues were studying something that he'd actually had a little bit of experience with before, an explosive called nitroglycerin. Now, this compound, yes, you may know it was used by Alfred Nobel and his explosive workers. You may not know that even a hundred years before, back in the, what, 1870s, 1890s, they discovered that these workers, after they went home and were away from the nitroglycerin for a few days, they would start developing these headaches. Well, that's maybe a clue but we'll, we'll touch on that clue again a little bit later today. Let's go back to 1970 with that young Dr. Lou Ignaro and his research team. It finally happened. They found that nitroglycerin worked by releasing a tiny molecule or a tiny compound called nitric oxide in the body. It turns out this this nitric oxide, this chemical has a lot of different uses. We'll get into that too. It uh, increased blood flow, as we said, reduces chest pain. Remember, the original research was on nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin was discovered to be a great treatment, and it still is, for angina, pain related to not getting enough blood flow to the muscle of the heart. At that time, back in 1970, nobody was aware of, of that tiny, that chemical called nitric oxide. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Ignaro's research team also revealed that not, nitric oxide, NO, plays a crucial role in preventing formation of plaque by promoting, or promoting the relaxation of blood vessels and inhibiting the adhesion of platelets or the stickiness of platelets to the vessel walls. Now you can learn a lot more about this at Dr. Ignaro's book, No More Heart Disease. You've heard me say no several times. Just put it together. No, N for nitric and O for oxide. And no, we're not talking about nitrous oxide, which you get at the dentist. We're talking about nitric oxide. Now everybody has an opinion. But today we're going to present you with a simple way to understand the role of nitric oxide, especially answer those, uh, that question. What are three easy and especially natural steps for boosting my nitric oxide? So before we, uh, I hand it over to Jesus, I do want to make a comment. And it's a little bit of, uh, I warned Dr. Ignaro that we'll probably go there. One of my favorite shows is uh, Stephen Bartlett and Diary of a CEO. Stephen has this theory that there's often a dark side to folks that especially creative, especially productive people. And maybe that dark side has something to do with motivating them. You know, there's a little bit, I've been doing some research with on uh, Dr. Ignaro and found some interesting things about some mysterious explosions that happened when he was nearby. 
at his home. So we may go there if we get some time today. Hey, Sus, why don't you take it away? Absolutely. Let me see if I can make this thing work. We were talking about issues with the, the slides, but here we go. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your introduction, Dr. Brewer. Somebody said in the comments, Dr. Ignaro is a rock star in the medical field. He is, and we're going to go to the main show, I promise. I just want you to bear with me for a few seconds. Uh, we have an event at Dallas uh, on April, and I'm going to yield for a minute to Jeannie to talk a little more about it, and uh, she will share with you some critical information for that event. Jeannie. Okay. Thanks, Jesus. Um we are having a heart attack and stroke prevention summit in Dallas, April 18th through the 20th. I know there's um, some early bird special pricing still going on. Um, part of that is uh, when you do sign up, you'll get your lab work before the conference and then um, a CIMT at the conference. And then we're able to meet with you in a clinical situation while we're there and go over everything. So <clears throat> it'll fill up really fast. Um, so I would take advantage of this now. It's Valentine's Day. Think about your heart. And um, I hope it's a great show today. I appreciate that, Jeannie. And Je Jeannie was with us on the event at Florida. It was a complete success. We have had some people that went to that event at St. Petersburg and said, oh, is this something going to be different? Do I, do I gain something different? Yes, we have whole different topics, whole different methodology. We'll learn a lot. For those who were to the Tampa event, know that Dr. Brewer put me to modify slides at the middle of the night. <laughs> we're not doing that now. We're 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 improving our methods, and we're having a way to share with you critical information in a more interactive way. The last event was a success. We're pretty sure this one is going to be a blast. And uh, for those who tried to already go there and just hit a wall and said, "I don't want to use PayPal. That's the only way that we were." Uh, putting there for you to to get access to it. We now have changed that, so there's no longer that barrier for you. Uh, just go ahead, take a look at it, and and there we are. Thank you um, so much, Jeannie. Oh, one Jeannie, more thing, ahead. One more thing, Jesus. Um, we've had a lot of um, questions about how much uh, input we're going to put on women's cardiac health, too, mm -hmm. there, and, and we are really trying to make sure we do that. So just to throw that out there. Perfect. Okay. I appreciate that. So uh, let's let's move on and then let's introduce our rock star for today, Dr. Lou Ignaro. Dr. Ignaro, take it away. Ah, yes. Hi, how are you? I'm so happy to be able to uh, to be on the show and uh, I look forward to uh, providing as much information as I could about the importance of nitric oxide uh, in the body and why you should be concerned uh, about maintaining the production and action of NO in the body. I'm going to be uh, uh, inter uh, switching back and forth from saying nitric oxide to NO, which is the scientific uh, uh, abbreviation or symbol for the molecule nitric oxide. But before I begin, <clears throat> I just want to uh, give the viewers some information regarding my uh, background, which I think you might find uh, interesting. Uh, my mom and dad were immigrants from Italy, and they moved to the U.S. Uh, in the 1930s. They settled in, in New York, New York City. Uh, at the time, my parents spoke Italian but did not speak any English whatsoever. Uh, I came along in 1941, uh, and my when I was able to speak as I was growing up, my Italian was, was perfect, but my English was terrible. So that when I started uh, kindergarten and the first grade, the teachers uh, uh, indicated to my parents that we were gonna have a problem here because I really couldn't communicate well with either the teacher or the students. And uh, I might have a serious problem in, in learning, taking tests and so on. And so my mom responded to that and immediately stopped speaking Italian at home. She learned to speak oh my English. Goodness. And, and my, uh, I, I, I began to speak English uh, and probably took me until the third grade before my English was acceptable 
and my classmates uh, uh, finally stopped making fun of my, my speaking with my Italian accent. And despite all that, the reason I'm saying this is that one should never use that as a handicap because despite that handicap, eventually I was able to progress, uh, go on to college, medical school, and climb to the top of my profession and get awarded a, uh, the Nobel Prize in medicine. So I always so, tell people, if I can do it, you can do it. I got to ask the question. So <clears throat> you, you were from, where did you live? Was it Brooklyn or? I was born in Brooklyn, but actually that's where my, my mom's physician was. But I was raised about 10 miles away in Long Beach, Long Island. New York. Okay. Sure. Long Island. That's it. So, Long Island. Took me yeah. a long time to get rid of that. So, well, that's what I was going to say. So you start with Italian, you get beat up a little bit on that. And <laughs> then you learn not really Midwestern uh, English, Midwestern U.S. English. You learn more of that Eastern New York. Yes. The New York accent. Yeah. Yes. I was, that, at, I was there for seven years and that doesn't, you don't sound like it now. It took me a long time to uh, get rid of that accent. Uh, when I left my hometown to go to medical school and graduate school at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, uh, the people there speak perfect English. The New Yorkers do not speak perfect English. And so when I got up to speak and give presentations, uh, the faculty would not allow me to speak until I learned to speak English properly and got rid of my accent. So that scared the heck out of me, believe me. And it motivated me to learn to speak English correctly. So after a few months, I, I, I got better and then I continually improved. Are you comfortable sharing that story about what the, uh, what the professor said to you? Oh, of course. I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to share that. This was in the graduate part of my education. And when you're in graduate school, uh, you have to get up every couple of months to give a presentation about a scientific article, a medical article, let's say. So I uh, got up for the first time to, uh, to give my first presentation. And about two minutes into my presentation, the chairman of the department stood up and said, Mr. Ignaro, stop. I'm going to stop you there. And I cannot understand a word you're saying, and I'm sure nobody else in this room can. So I'm going to ask you to sit down, and you cannot give your first presentation until you learn to speak English correctly. And, uh, you know, I mean, my heart rate must have gone up to 200. Uh, I was sweating. I sat down. As it turns out, the other faculty members were quite upset with the chairman for making <laughs> such a remark. But let me tell you, that created a condition in me which allowed me uh, and motivated me to improve my English. And when I graduated uh, four years later, the chairman of the department in front of the entire faculty congratulated me on being able to speak English. <laughs> wow. Now, what did you do to change that accent? Well, that I, lived, accent. I lived with two guys. The three of us uh, were roommates in, in graduate school, and uh, they agreed with, with the chairman that my English, you know, the accent was terrible, uh, but they didn't really want to say anything to me. So what we mm -hmm. did was... One of them, Norm, I remember, his name was Norm, he bought a small, uh, well, in those days it was large, tape recorder. You know, the technology was not so great back then. We're talking about the 1960s. He bought a tape recorder and he asked me to read a paragraph from, you know, from a science book. And I read it and then he played it back. And that's when I realized, oh my God, I can't even understand what I'm saying. I wow. recognized that the accent was so bad. So my two roommates worked with me literally for six months, having me practice to speak, correcting me, and so on. <clears throat> and uh, as I said, in about six months, my English improved dramatically. 
and I was able to catch myself uh, <clears throat> speaking improperly, you know, as I went through graduate school. And eventually I got rid of most of the New York accent, not completely. When I go back to New York, my accent comes right back, of course, oh, yeah. speaking with the people there. Yeah, mine does too. I've, as we shared, I, I have some of my own challenges. I uh, grew up in South Carolina and you can tell, but you can't tell how bad it was. And <laughs> I got, when, when I got to Hopkins, it was uh, very competitive and I got beat up a lot. So, uh, you know, pe this is already starting to sound a little bit more like a, a diary of a CEO kind of interview. We, people <laughs> get the idea that, oh, well, you were just working in a lab and you just discovered something. No, there was a whole, there were decades of, of painful challenges to get through. Dr. Brewer, you're talking about accent. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't even raised the issue for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a, a lot of stuff to learn from both of you, not just nitric oxide. Now, uh, <laughs> let let me bring it back a little bit to nitric oxide. Uh, so, for those who are followers to the channel for a long time, you know sometimes we go a little bit on uh, context mode and we don't go to the key answers. So I'm gonna do something that Dr. Bure, I hope you don't mind, Dr. Gennaro. Can, can we do this? Can you tell us those three simple, easy ways to boost nitric oxide? And then we can talk about the history of how did you come up to those conclusions? How do you, you went through the process of discovering nitric oxide and, and what, it, what, what, what other stuff that you would like to share with us today? Sure. Well, you know, uh, what I'm about to tell you, of course, took decades Mm -hmm. uh, to get to get to that point. So when we made the first discovery that our bodies produce this molecule nitric oxide, one study led to another, led to another, some uh, conducted by us in our lab and some by others in their laboratories. And so after about 30 years, let's see, 20, after about 40 years, I would say, of research, we came to realize, and not, well, the first thing we realized was the importance of nitric oxide in health and longevity. And I'll tell you about that later. But the point I want to make is that it's important to be certain that your body is continually making this molecule nitric oxide. And sometimes during disease, it does not make enough. And there are factors that cause you to have deficient amounts of nitric oxide. When that happens, this can create cardiovascular problems, starting from type 2 diabetes to hypertension or high blood pressure to a coronary artery disease, which is, is another word for atherosclerosis, or deposition of plaque, cholesterol plaques in your arteries. It can lead to a stroke and so on. So what can you do to boost your nitric oxide production? And after all the research that's been done, there are three main ways. And whenever I explain this to people, they say, well, they, they don't believe me. They say, well, it's too simple. How, 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 can, how can we... How can this be true? And so the three main ways to boost your nitric oxide, we and others have found, is number one, to eat a healthy, balanced diet. Healthy, balanced nutrition. Okay, and I can get back to that. That's another five-hour talk all in itself. <laughs> so besides healthy, balanced nutrition, one of the most important things you should consider and do is physical activity. Another name for physical activity is exercise. Mm -hmm. I tend not to use the word exercise because every time I speak to people and I'm looking in their faces and I say the word exercise, they roll their eyes or look down because most people don't want to do exercise. But if I say physical activity, <coughs> they pay more attention to what I'm saying. And I can explain, and I'd love to later, 
why and how physical activity can boost your nitric oxide. It's so simple to understand. And the third way, which is the most recent way we have found, is that when you breathe, it's a good idea whenever you can to inhale or breathe through your nose. Okay, why? Just ask people who do lots of yoga. They like to breathe through their nose. Your nasal mucosa, the cells inside your inside your nostrils, in your nose, constantly produce very large amounts of nitric oxide, which is a gas. NO in its natural state is a gas. Hmm. Your nose produces nitric oxide. The gas comes out of your mucosal cells in the nose. <clears throat> and if you inhale through your nose, you're breathing the NO into your lungs. Okay, why is that important? Nitric oxide relaxes the airways, what you can think of as the trachea or the bronchioles. If you relax the airways, you get more air into your lungs. That means you get more oxygen into your lungs. Nitric oxide is a very powerful vasodilator. This means it widens the blood vessels. So it'll widen your pulmonary arteries. This means not only do you get more air into your lungs, you get more blood into your lungs. And that's important because the blood is then going to extract the oxygen from the air that's in your lungs and carry it throughout the body. Okay? So those are two very important uh, functions of the NO made by your nasal cavities. And the third one which was discovered during COVID, is that nitric oxide is a very powerful antiviral molecule. Mm. It kills viruses. One of the most sensitive viruses to the killing action of NO is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the one that causes COVID-19. So during COVID, I published a number of papers. I did a number of podcasts and, and, and videos for the news media to encourage people to inhale through the nose. The more nitric oxide you bring in the nose, the more you can protect your lungs against this COVID virus. Remember, you remember now when I tell you that the, the way the COVID virus gets into you and makes you sick and kills you is through in the lungs. It gets into the nose and into your lungs. People die of COVID because they, 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 they can't breathe anymore. There's, there's a lack of blood flow, a lack of oxygenation, and most importantly, there's very little NO to kill the virus. So that's why it's important to breathe through your nose also, people have found now that NO is effective also against the influenza virus and God knows what other kind of virus. So whenever you can, it's important to breathe in through the nose to protect yourself from those pulmonary conditions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lou. Sure. Dr. Brewer, do you have something or may I continue? I, I, uh, I, I, think see, you... I see your eyes. You're thinking about something. <laughs> I know you're enough to know. They look like my eyes sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to go down, to, down in the geek world. I was unaware of that antiviral <laughs> capacity, and I'm wondering, what is it about that that does that? What's the mechanism? I don't well, know if we've got time, but if, well, if you've got a... Uh, nitric, oxide, nitric oxide is a very reactive molecule. You know, it's a free radical uh, uh, it has a, a, it's a very reactive molecule, does a lot of good things in the body to our cells, uh -huh. but because of its chemistry, it's able to react with certain components of the viral protein uh, and tear it apart. So interesting. Neat. Yeah. It okay, Jesus. Cool. That's Thank why I call it a much. miracle molecule. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now, uh, this is this is for I'm I'm thinking a lot about the audience that we were on the in the YouTube world we're like we want to provide a title for a video that people will get something out of it. Dr. Lou just provided 
something critical for somebody who clicked on the video and you're new to the channel, you wanted to know those three easy steps. Dr. Lou, just summarize that for you. What you eat, how you move, breathing through your nose. So let's talk a little bit about how you eat. Uh, if you look at YouTube, you will see different places where they say, you should eat this, you should eat that. What do you think, Dr. Lou, are the best sources of food that you need to eat to improve the, your nitric oxide? Sure. Again, that, that's a very lengthy topic, and I will uh, focus on, uh, on healthy foods that boost nitric oxide, and there's so many of them. First of all, there are three different food groups, right? There are protein, carbohydrate, and fat. You need to have all three. I personally do not believe in diets that tell you, oh, you should eat mainly protein and not eat carbohydrate, or you should avoid fat. I'm afraid that I just will never agree with that. In my opinion, that's incorrect. I hope I don't hurt anybody's feelings, but you know, your body was designed to eat those three food groups. Evolution has allowed us and forced us to eat certain kinds of foods. You know, we did not evolve to eat only protein and no carbs in order to lose weight. We did not evolve to skip fats because someone said that fats, you know, raise calories. No. So you, you have to eat the healthy versions of protein, right? There's healthy and unhealthy protein. You don't want to eat meat with a lot of fat on it. That's unhealthy protein. But lean beef is better. Chicken without fat is better. And the best one of all is fish. Fish is almost solid protein. No saturated fats. In my opinion, one of the healthiest foods you can eat. If we go to the vegetable and fruit side, we evolved to eat lots of fruits and vegetables from the ground, from the trees, and so on. If you notice, every fruit and vegetable has a different color. And you will notice that some of these fruits and vegetables have a dark color. Okay, the dark color is due to the presence of certain chemicals inside the fruits and vegetables called antioxidants. Okay, you've heard that. Why, is, yeah, why are antioxidants sure. important? Because nitric oxide is very unstable and only lasts for a few seconds once you make it because it oxidizes. If you eat antioxidants, you prevent the destruction of nitric oxide mm -hmm. that will boost your nitric oxide. And it's so easy to remember because every time you go to the market, the grocery store, whatever, you see all these different kinds of fruits and vegetables. The darker the color, the more the antioxidants. Okay, fruits, pomegranate, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, incredibly healthy fruits. A banana, eh, it's, it's healthy. It's got lots of fiber, but not too many antioxidants. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we go to the vegetable side. My goodness, we have, we have beets. That's the new fad today. People are eating beets. They're buying beetroot juice. They're buying beet extract. Beets, if you get uh, uh, some of the beet juice on your white shirt, that's it. You got to throw away the shirt. <clears throat> it's stained. <laughs> It's incredibly dark, loaded with antioxidants. Same thing for kale, spinach, Brussels sprouts, broccoli. You know, so every time you go to the market, if you see all these dark fruits and vegetables, buy them, eat them. Very healthy, great way to boost your NO. And finally, we have fats. There are unhealthy fats, like fats from meats, lard, and so on, that you need to avoid because saturated fats will destroy your nitric oxide. Probably the most common cause of cardiovascular disease is consumption of saturated fats in beef, which destroys your NO. There are lots of unsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats like olive oil, if you're going to use a fat, use olive oil. It tastes great. It's healthy. And then, of course, you have your poly, 
unsaturated fats. I think everybody has heard of omega-3 fatty acids. Fish oil, you can buy it left and right in any store. Those are good. I'm not advocating to buy it. You don't have to buy it as long as you eat fish two or three days a week. Fish has fish oil. That's why it's named fish oil. And it's loaded with omega-3 fatty acids, which boost your nitric oxide. So I'll stop there in case there are any questions. <laughs> but that, that's a whole seminar condensed in five minutes. You, you can tell uh, Dr. Lu's experience on this field. It's, it's, it's really, really incredible. I have a few things to mention, but I'm going to yield to the boss, Dr. Brewer. No, go, go ahead. I, I, I see it in your eyes. You want to say something? <laughs> No, that's okay, Jesus. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to say it then if you don't want to say it. Uh, Dr. Lu, uh, on our audience, we have a lot of people who are uh, interested in preventing cardiovascular disease. That's kind of the whole deal of this channel. Uh, we focus more on a lot of on the dangers of insulin resistance, pre-diabetes and diabetes. Mm -hmm. And for some people... Uh, uh, might want to see a clash on saying, oh, let's talk about everything that we don't agree with. But I think we should focus on the things that we agree with. And I think from the list of fruits, the list, list of vegetables that you provided, th th there's, to me, that's kind of a, another reason to people considering eating all of those. Dr. Brew likes to say also, we don't focus too much on diets. We focus more about knowing your metabolism, knowing your body, what you need, and thinking about nitric oxide and the importance of keeping a healthy level of nitric oxide in your body, knowing where to get it, that's going to be really important. Of course. Now, I want to ask you about supplements because hey, we'll, that's Jesus, a... Oh, okay. I, now that... <laughs> I, I mean... I changed my mind. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> so... <laughs> so people consider us a low carb channel and we do uh, recommend that people limit their carbs, to, but, on, but only like a hundred or less per day. And it's not so much because of um, we think everybody should be on low carb or keto. Here's the issue. If you look at um, in Haines, you know, the National Health and uh, Nutrition Examination Survey and some of the other, other, you know, CDC, other places where it's become clear we're in the midst of a prediabetes, diabetes, insulin resistance epidemic. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> when you look at what's considered to be aging, most qu air quote normal aging components really have to do more with undiagnosed Diabetes. I mean, you, you start to look at the epidemiology and as we get into our 60s, 70s and 80s, most of us have this problem. Unfortunately, 90 percent of it is undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. So as Jesus said, I'm not interested in getting in, in, into a debate about, um, you know, wh what's the best diet? People try to get me into that all the time. We ha we actually had, I'm sure you know the name, Robert Lustig. Yeah. We had uh, Dr. Lustig on the channel a few weeks ago, and we're actually in a very similar place to where he is. And that is um, the only diet that we think that doesn't work or can't work is the standard American diet, the sad <laughs> diet. It's just way too many fats, uh, unhealthy fats, way too many unhealthy carbs, and just piling it on way too much. Our perspective on diet is understand, uh, since uh, diabetes and prediabetes are so prevalent and so few people are aware, first, assess the situation. Understand your own metabolism. So that's that's our perspective on diet. Of course. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, I, may I add something to it? Please, 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 please do. You know, I look at it, there's so many different diets. You know, there how many books have been written on oh, this? You should take this. Where are you? We out. have lots of pre-diabetes. Oh. We have this, we have that, do this, do that. You know, I don't want to say everybody is wrong or everybody's right. So I look at it from a scientific point of view, based on the discoveries that I have made, 
that many other people in the field have made. We know absolutely that have, raising your nitric oxide and keeping it normal prevents prediabetes. It prevents the development of the metabolic syndrome, which is not a term used much anymore because it's very vague and broad. But if, if people maintain their nitric oxide production and action when they're teenagers or in the 20s, then I maintain that as long as you eat sensibly and you engage in physical activity, you'll never get type 2 diabetes or diabetes or cardiovascular disease. L let me point something out. We, I hope everybody believes in evolution. I believe in evolution. We evolved from monkeys, apes, orangutans, and so on. When we, in, the, in those prehistoric days, Evidence has accumulated to show that our predecessors did not have diabetes, did not develop type 2 diabetes, or they were not pre-diabetic. There was rarely an incidence of coronary artery disease or plaque formation or whatever. These prehistoric ancestors ate off the ground. They ate fish. Yes, they did eat some meat. That's true. Uh, but perhaps not every single day. I mean, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't know for sure. But they did not eat any processed foods. There were no processed foods in those days. Plus, they had to hunt and gather, and they moved around. Lots of physical activity. What has been shown more recently is that if you take the uh, the animals, the, the apes and the monkeys and so on that come into the zoos, as soon as you capture them, if you do studies, you see that they have no signs of diabetes or cardiovascular disease or hypertension or anything else. But once they're held in captivity for several years or more, they begin to get symptoms of cardiovascular disease that humans get. So all I'm trying to point out is that if you, if you go back and you stay away from processed foods and you eat yes. healthy, balanced, nutritional meals, then I think that you'll be much better off in the long run. Now, people who have diabetes already or are overweight and are ready to get diabetes, you know, then you have to take perhaps a little bit more of an aggressive approach approach to solve those problems. But I'll stop there. Absolutely. Hey, sis, I've got a quick digression before we start getting uh, comments. Not uh, really. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll make <laughs> it quick. Uh, before we start getting comments uh, uh, about uh, evolution, human evolution, yeah, we'll get, you know, there'll be a few comments about that. I got to sh share my own quick story. I used to work in one of the few um, retail uh, available human genetics labs. We were having discussions about a, a thing called haptoglobin. You may be familiar with it. And mm -hmm. you could actually track the, uh, the development and evolution uh, and spread of that, of that molecule. And I'm sitting there talking and I stopped for a second and I said, you know, this is very interesting. I'm sitting with the lab, um, the lab scientist, uh, world-class lab scientist, fundamentalist Catholic, and the lab director who is a, I mean, a very conservative Catholic, and then the lab director who was a fundamentalist Christian, and they were both talking about human evolution. <laughs> they looked at me like, yeah, <laughs> so? <laughs> So right, the, right. for the for people that want to start throwing those bananas that Lou was talking about a few minutes ago, <laughs> it, it, slow down. This is a little bit more complicated uh, topic than people like to make it. Anyhow, you brought up a really good point um, about nitric oxide being a huge preventative for getting into this kind of shape, prediabetes, yes. diabetes. Mm -hmm. Jesus was getting ready to talk about a couple of supplements. So after having interrupted and dragged us back, Jesus, down that bunny hole, I'm going to give it back to you. 
So, so let me start by asking. So, what was the conclusion of a Christian and a Catholic go together and, in, and enter into a lab? <laughs> well, they, you know, what they were saying was, well, uh, the point was they had their beliefs. It didn't change at all. And they understood from the work they were doing that humans do change. Our genetics change. And it's sure. there's just no question about that. Of so course. it really becomes more a That's question cool. of context, which I don't want to get into in terms of um each, we each only have so much core. time, Dr. Lou. <laughs> we right. can't pull the ocean. <laughs> right. So, so Dr. Dr. Lou, let me let me interject, Dr. Brewer. Let's go to supplements before we lose audience. I'm always okay. th- now. I'm on the YouTube there mindset. You I'm sorry about that. Hey, uh, is Dr. turning into an editor and creator. Yeah, yeah. I'm failing miserably. <laughs> so, Dr. Lou, uh, <laughs> uh, what's your opinion on supplements? You have seen people saying, "Oh, you should take this." nitric oxide supplement or is it better to use arginine and citrulline or does it even matter or should you get it from your diet right okay that's a that's a very good point uh, right at the outset i just want to say that um i have had no longer but i have had a relationship with uh, the herbalife international company in which i uh, helped to design uh, arginine supplement for heart heart health so but i no longer have that arrangement so but i i I present that uh, information to you there's so many supplements out there and people get so confused about these supplements you mentioned these nitric oxide supplements i think they're all good and here's why when your body makes nitric oxide it can only make it from an amino acid called arginine. Yes, you eat arginine. If you if you eat healthy protein every day, you're getting plenty of arginine. So to live a normal, healthy life, I don't think you need to take arginine. But there are lots of claims with lots of pretty good clinical trials, small clinical trials, showing uh, in exercise physiology that if you take, if you boost your arginine intake, you could boost your nitric oxide production. That's been shown many times. And that could increase your exercise or workout performance and endurance. Uh, so that's been shown. So if you want to make your, you know, boost your performance in in terms of doing physical activity, I think it's it's good to take those supplements. Uh, I routinely take arginine and also citrulline. Citrulline was discovered a little bit later to be probably more important because citrulline is another amino acid which, by the way, is present in watermelons and other melons. But citrulline in the body is converted to arginine. And arginine is converted to nitric oxide. And citrulline gets into the cells much, much better than arginine. So if you're going to take those supplements, probably better to take citrulline. Okay. Uh, I routinely take citrulline because, you know, not, I'm 82 years old, so I'm not interested in, in continuing my running of marathons. I'm not taking those supplements in order to boost my athletic performance. I'm taking those supplements because I believe in my heart, pun intended, that <laughs> I will boost my nitric oxide and, you know, maybe I'll have a healthy car- healthier cardiovascular system. Maybe that'll expand my uh, longevity. It's never been proven. These kind of studies are impossible (laughs) to prove. How how do you do a clinical study on that? But they're non-toxic. The science is there, so I take them. But that's just the amino acids. Then there are other supplements. I I do not sell. I have nothing to do with selling fish oil. But in my humble opinion, taking supplements of omega-3 fatty acids is one of the healthiest things you can do especially if you don't like fish, if you don't eat a lot of fish. You know, if you don't live in coastal areas and fish in the Midwest, for example, is too expensive, uh, you need to 
to, to take your supplements of omega-3 fatty acids. When you have your physical uh, uh, blood test can be done to, to determine you know, whether your omega-3s are okay, not okay, and so on. But that's some, something that you, you know, could, could keep in mind. But as I said before, if you eat a normal, healthy, uh, balanced diet, even if you did not take any supplements, I think you would be in good shape. But, you know, you can, you might be better off by taking certain supplements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lou. I'm going to start by saying I need, uh, I'm going to ask for a copy of those tapings that you mentioned about your accent. I think I could le learn a lot from those. And the second one is, uh, let, let me let me digress to physical exercise. We can move to that now. Sure. What would you say is the best type of exercise for this purpose? Not the, the accent, best, the nitric the, oxide. The best kind of... <laughs> Exercise, if you don't, if you're not a person who works out, and you you may not believe this, is just walking. Walking a little faster than normal, not jogging, but just walking briskly for 30, 40 minutes a day, three or four days a week. It's been shown over and over again that really that's all you need to do, that causes a decrease in all-cause mortality, which means walking like that continue, continually every, every week will increase your chances of, uh, of, of living longer. That's the bottom line. You know, it's, it's nice to see that so many uh, people have done studies on this such that it's influenced the government the U.S. government to issue guidelines about exercise. And if you go online, you can see all these crazy guidelines, you know, for people who are younger or moderate age, elderly. Uh, and, and, and the bottom line is you just have to keep moving. You just have to have your body move. Don't sit in a chair all day long. And if you do, uh, get up and walk around every once in a while. But again, like I said, three or four days a week, walking a half hour, 40 minutes, briskly. Uh, that's all you need to do. That would be the minimum. If you like to jog, you should jog. If you like to swim, go swimming. If you belong to a gym or you have weights at home, weightlifting is good and so on. There's so many different levels. Let, let me let me just, and I thank, thank you so much, Dr. Lou. Dr. Brewer, if you don't interrupt me, I'm going to take it over. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, sis, uh, you're doing great. <laughs> So uh, today, uh, at some point, I will yeah. have questions about the test strips for nitric oxide. Sure. Uh, why, why don't we do that right now? I have okay. I have something to, but let's do that right now, Doctor Brewer, before you okay. forget. I, I'm I've never used them. I wasn't yeah. aware of them but until the show, and I started seeing comments yeah. about them. Are they don't, good? Don't use them. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I, I'm a scientist, so I have to critically evaluate things that are brought before me. So these strips were developed a while back when different manufacturers were claiming, and they're correct, that if you consume nitrates and nitrites, sodium nitrite, mm -hmm. sodium nitrate, nitrites and nitrates are present in root vegetables. That's one of the reasons why beets and carrots and spinach are healthy, because they have nitrates and nitrites. As the name may imply, nitric oxide is built into that. So <clears throat> if you consume nitrate and nitrite, they are converted to nitric oxide in the body. And, and, and that's a good thing. The problem is that you have to consume an awful lot to make this nitric oxide. I think it's better if one takes arginine or citrulline because then your nitric oxide is made in your blood vessels, you know, for mm. in the in, in, in ASUS in the endothelial cells. We didn't even get into that. That's where you want the NO made. If you consume nitrates and nitrates, you make NO, it just gets into the blood and it's most of it's inactivated. But but so P 
people develop these strips, nitric oxide strips, because if you take a strip and you put it in your mouth under your tongue, if it turns red, it means, supposed to mean that you have a lot of nitric oxide, you're fine. If it doesn't change color, it means you should take more nitric oxide. These people were selling nitrate and nitrite mm. supplements, mm -hmm. small tablets. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to get into the chemistry, okay? Those strips react with nitrate and nitrite to turn red. If you take those strips, and I've done it in my laboratory and I've talked about it at meetings. If you take those strips and you dip it into a solution of nitric oxide, doesn't change color. Mm -hmm. Those strips are measuring nitrate. They are not measuring NO. If you eat some bacon with your bacon and eggs, mm -hmm. bacon is loaded with nitrite. Nitrite Nitrous. is added to bacon to right. give a, 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 a deeper red color. If you have a piece of bacon, chew it up, swallow it, and then stick that strip in your mouth, it'll be bright red. That has nothing to do with NO. Uh, okay. Okay, so now I... I I'm going to get a lot of mail. <laughs> How could you put down those strips? I've already put them down. Send the mail. I'm very happy to talk scientifically with you about it. So, Jesus, I do have one other thing, and, and I do think it's very important. Sure. Before the show, we were talking, uh, uh, Lou was talking about all of the different places where nitric oxide impacts uh metabolism uh i think if can we do that now just lou if you could just tell us a little bit more about all of the different places we know that there's something in terms of intima or the endothelium yeah. which you just mentioned we haven't sure. talked about that there's a, a gazillion other places sure. oh yeah well uh, and if you want to use a slide you can if you don't if you don't oh, no, this, no, this is uh, uh this is fine um when, nitro, when we first discovered, one of the major discoveries my lab made, besides showing that nitroglycerin works by being metabolized to nitric oxide in our blood vessels, the most important finding was that we showed that our bodies can actually produce nitric oxide. Good, you can leave that on. This was not known before. Nitric oxide is a pollutant in the Earth's atmosphere. That's all it was thought to be. But we studied the pharmacology of nitric oxide and found that it did so many interesting things that we had a suspicion that maybe our bodies actually produced nitric oxide. And we found that it did. And where did we find the, the nitric oxide production? In arteries, in the endothelial cells of the arteries. Let's take a look at this figure. This is a cartoon. It's a cross-section of an artery. In the middle, you have the <clears throat> red area. That's the lumen. That's where the blood flows through. Okay. Adjacent to the lumen, you have the endothelial cells. The, this is a single layer, just a single layer of cells that lines the intima or inner lining of the artery, also the vein. But here we're talking about arteries. Okay. Now, just to the outside of the endothelial cells, you'll see the smooth muscle cells. When the smooth muscle cells contract, that causes vasoconstriction. That will raise the blood pressure and reduce blood flow. When the smooth muscle cells relax, that'll lower the blood pressure and improve blood flow. Okay, so this nitric oxide is made in the endothelial cells. It has several functions. One, if you look in the bottom, that endothelium-derived nitric oxide can diffuse. It goes through cells, gets to the smooth muscle, relaxes it to get a vasodilation. Okay, the same nitric oxide from the endothelial cells, if you look to the right, can interact with nearby platelets that are circulating in the blood and it prevents 
those platelets from sticking onto the intimal lining. You don't want platelets to mm -hmm. stick on the intimal lining because when they stick, they form a blood clot. If the blood clot grows and grows, you can get a stroke because you can impair blood flow. In addition, that same nitric oxide will prevent the sticking of white blood cells. You don't want white blood cells to stick on the endothelial layer because it'll penetrate and get into the smooth muscle where it'll grow. You'll get plaque formation. You'll get what's called atherosclerosis. And if it's in the heart, it's coronary artery disease. Now, finally, some of that nitric oxide, if you see that big uh, arrow in the middle, some of that nitric oxide gets into the blood and a little bit of it can bind to hemoglobin, the same hemoglobin that binds oxygen. Mm -hmm. And the hemoglobin will take that nitric oxide and carry it downstream to different parts of the body to release that NO where it is needed to cause more vasodilation and improvement of blood flow. So that's the those are the major effects of the endothelium derived NO, which is produced by your arteries. And this has profound effects. Yes, it can prevent stroke. It can prevent heart attack because it can prevent the development of uh, plaques and uh, it can prevent uh, the, the obstruction to blood flow in the artery. That's one of the causes of a heart attack. It also prevents hypertension because as your arteries constrict, more NO is released to relax the smooth muscle cells to dilate the arteries and you go back to normal tension or a normal blood pressure. This picture is very important when you exercise or move around. When you move around, the nit more nitric oxide is released in the arteries in your working muscle, in your skeletal muscle, to improve blood flow, to bring more blood, therefore more oxygen, therefore more nutrients to your working skeletal muscle. So you can continue you know, to, to work out. So that's a major importance here. Another one, which we may or may not get to, I hope we can, is that this vasodilation produced by nitric oxide also occurs in the erectile tissue, both male and female, especially the male. Uh, this creates uh, or stimulates erectile function, which of course is, is very uh, important for sexual intercourse and so on. We also made that discovery. Well, well, so, Doctor Doctor Lou, Doctor Brew, if I may, Doctor Lou just kind of uh, read my mind. So today is Valentine's Day. <laughs> We're discussing about the exercise. You mentioned walking, which is more important. Where is sex on those top tier exercises to increase nitric oxide? Well, and I also have to add, by the way, since Jesus is continuing to look out for our viewers, as we mentioned earlier. Three quarters of our viewers are male. Uh, over half of them are fifty-five and older. So this is a yeah. <laughs> this is a big topic. Yeah, oh, well, no, it, it's a big topic, that. and and uh, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about it. But yes, Asus, uh, uh, in getting involved in different sexual engagements, of course, that's a form of exercise, and that will boost your nitric oxide production. But but that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here <laughs> is that. Uh, before 1990, which is not too long ago, there was no known cure or therapy for erectile dysfunction in men, which, by the way, I don't know if you folks realize that over 300 million men globally suffer from erectile dysfunction. 300 million uh, I would think that an equal number of women are disappointed uh, in that. But uh, so we, I'm not going to tell you how, but we made a discovery in, in 1992. We published it in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a pretty good medical journal. And what we showed. I've heard of what, it. Yeah. What we showed <laughs> is that the nerves, the nerves that go to the erectile tissue in the penis uh, is nitric oxide. 
the, the nerves release a neurotransmitter that's nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. Before that, we didn't know what the neurotransmitter was. Therefore, there was no known cause of erectile dysfunction and no drugs to treat it. Once we discovered that the neurotransmitter released from the nerves that causes penile erection was nitric oxide, ah, now we had a handle on this. People raised the question, do people with erectile dysfunction make very little or none of this nitric oxide? Is this why they have erectile dysfunction? The answer turned out to be correct. This was made by clinical people, not by me, but we published our original findings in 92, and six short years later, the Pfizer Corporation, which I have nothing to do with, marketed sildenafil. The trade name is Viagra. Viagra for the treatment of erectile dysfunction. These guys, and they told me later, paid a lot of attention to my work, reproduced my findings, and developed a drug that can boost nitric oxide action in the erectile tissue in the penis. And so in the great majority So did they give you a cases, commission? I'm sorry? Pardon the interruption, but you didn't get yeah. a commission on that. Oh, no, no, no. Because you see, <laughs> what, we discovered, wow. what we discovered was a physiological, natural process. The Nobel Prize or, or, or honoraria or whatever, they're not, they're not given out for discovering a new physiological process. Now, yeah. since I had nothing to do with the chemistry, with the synthesis of Viagra as a drug to be marketed, then I would not be expected to share in any profits because I was not employed by Pfizer. I had nothing. They designed the drug themselves based on my work. So they get that credit. But uh, let me tell you, uh, all the scientists know who made that possible. And Pfizer Corporation has been really good to me ever since. I won't, I won't explain how, but uh, they have been very good to me. I, I, I'm guessing. And, I'm and guessing. Not, I, I, and, not, I love, and, not just, and not just with free samples of that little blue pill. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. A, a, a lifetime's... Uh... So uh, let, let me explain of, of why that's not important to me. You see, being Italian, I don't have that problem. <laughs> oh, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Uh, know well, that, that's, what can I say? And then, <laughs> well, I how can like you follow one, that? You can't one, follow up on that. Small story to this, which I, I find fascinating. We did our work in 1992 and published it in New England Journal of Medicine. Pfizer markets Viagra in March of 1998. A few months later, in October of 1998, the Nobel Prize for nitric oxide gets announced. And there I am receiving the Nobel Prize from King Carl Gustav in Stockholm. And keep that slide up. What I just want to say is when the Nobel Prize was announced in October, I said to myself, oh, my goodness, does this have anything to do with Viagra? Is it a coincidence or what? So I decided to look up the members, the committee members of the Nobel Prize Committee for Medicine. And guess what? I found that all of them were men over the age of 60. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, if that's the reason, that's fine. But, you know, one of the things, now that the viewers are looking at my receiving the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, take a look, please, folks. Look at what we are standing on, on the carpet. That is N-O, uh -oh. nitric oxide. <laughs> of course, it, that really stands for Nobel. But, you know, I think yeah, it stands man. for nitric oxide. Definitely. We this all is, have our this is really good. This is really good. Yeah. I got a quick lightning round. Uh, you can stop on them if you want. Some of them we've already covered, but uh, we get a lot of questions here. I'm trying to respond to as many of as, as we, we can, can. We can hear you typing, Dr. Brewer. Of course. Oh, sorry. So, so um, let's go to Q&A if you want. 
as I told you, Lou, he's uh, Jesus is always after me on this stuff. So, real quick, uh, yes or no? Sunlight. Yes. Uh, grounding. Grounding. Where you take your shoes off and and your feet touch the the earth, or you use well, these ground. Yeah, I don't really have an opinion on that. Okay. Uh, have Arginine. You heard, have well, I think he answered already uh, arginine, right? And citrulline. Yeah, Arginine's good, citrulline. but citrulline's better. Those are good amino acids to, to be sure that you consume enough of to make NO. Cold exposure. Uh, that That's so controversial. Uh, I mean, cold exposure can stimulate nitric oxide formation. It can stimulate the formation of numerous things. Oh, you wanted yes or no. Well, no, uh, that, no, this is good. Uh, but, but, you know, if you talk to the Asian population, they would disagree with that. Uh, they don't like the cold. They think that the cold can promote heart attacks and strokes. So, again, not enough information available for me to give my opinion. Good. Uh, and then the same point, sauna and nitric oxide. Uh, I don't think sauna can hurt you. Many people think it can benefit you. Sauna can relax muscles because of the heat and moisture. You get vasodilation that improves your blood flow to your muscles. And many people I know, uh, including myself once in a while, do a sauna after a workout. So I'd say yes. And the last one, proton pump inhibitors, antacids. Well, you're talking to a pharmacologist, okay? Somebody who studies the interaction of drugs with cells. In some people, proton pump inhibitors are important to take. If you do not have to take proton pump inhibitors, don't. Impact with, do they create or dis, where the, one of the questions was, they destroy NO? Uh, no, I don't think okay. they have any effect because they work in the stomach. And the important NO that you want in your body is made from all the arteries and capillaries throughout your body. So I don't think there's a negative impact there. So last uh, last one, and I'll hand it back to you, Jesus. You said last on the previous one. I know. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> speaking of uh, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, um, there has there's been a what appears to me in the literature a uh, significant improvement for this low grade uh, mild uh, prostatitis, taking a low dose um, Cialis. Um, any any comments on that? Yeah, I think that, first of all, for the viewers, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors are, are the drugs like Cialis, Viagra, and so on, uh, that are used to improve uh, erectile function, penile erection, and so on. But remember, the mechanism, they work by increasing the actions of nitric oxide and some other signaling molecules, which I won't get into. <clears throat> Some of these drugs, <clears throat> excuse me, can increase nitric oxide in areas other than the erectile tissue. For example, in the prostate gland, also in the pulmonary tissue. The point I'm trying to make is that these drugs at the appropriate dosage can boost the actions of nitric oxide in certain tissues. Nitric oxide, I talked about earlier, is an antiviral agent, but <clears throat> it is also anti-inflammatory. We didn't get into mm. that. One of the main reasons your body makes nitric oxide is to fight inflammation, to protect your arteries against inflammation, to protect your joints against inflammation. It is possible that by boosting the NO in various sites, you could cut back on inflammation. Prostatitis is a form of inflammation. So mm -hmm. that would be my best explanation for that uh, effect. 
Wonderful. Very good. Thank you so much. And Jesus, I'll quit disrupting your program here. Oh, God. Are you sure? <laughs> my show, my show. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, let's go to Q&A. Gilbert, can you give us a transition? So we might as well stop talking about weight loss and bring Dr. Lou every week. So there you go. <laughs> uh, if you are not a YouTube channel member, become one just like Chris Link is doing here, Dave A A, -A, -A C, and Lisa. So Lisa has a question and she bring out a super chat. Thank you so much. So lean mass hyper responders increase plaque on a CIMT two years apart. Low carb weights hit walking, maybe missing something. Could subclinical hypothyroidism have an effect? So, I'm not sure where that information is coming from. I don't, I'm not aware of any research on lean mass hyperresponder building plaque. Dr. Are you? No. Uh, You're familiar with lean mass hyperresponders? Uh, uh, not really. Not really. So there's a subgroup, and uh, it. It really became more well known on the internet with a lot of people doing low carb and keto dieting where their LDL would just shoot way up. Mm -hmm. But um, and I ended up getting a lot I end up getting a lot of calls about that. As you start getting deeper into the cutting edge science, it appears that um, that does happen. It it's uh, turning some things about cholesterol theory on its head. Uh, because of what we do, we get a lot of people uh, coming in on our channel or coming in to see us that are lean mass hyper responders. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you know Matthew Budoff. He's a cardio cardiology researcher in L.A. Uh, he's doing some work. What's that? Just the name. I, I've not interacted with him. <clears throat> what they did, just in short, what they did was they took a uh, hundred of these people, lean mass hyper responders, their LDL level was one in a thousand. It was like average. What was it? Was it two? What, what was it, Jesus? Was it one, two, 252, 272, something like that? Yeah. yeah. And then they did a cross section of these and they compared them to a cross section in the Miami Heart Study. They had not only they're saying that quote the same amount of plaque and in reality they appear to have a little bit less plaque so if you've got a group of a hundred people and their average is one in a thousand LDL you would think these people would just be full of plaque they're not but again it's it's these people also are metabolically very they're lean that's where the term lean comes from and um, their triglyceride over HDL, for example, is usually two or less. So they're really burning fats more so than carbs. Anyhow, this, this lady, I, I think she, Lisa might be describing her own experience. And what I would say is there are other risk factors, LP little a, uh, and as she brought up, uh, subclinical hypothyroidism could be a risk factor as well. Those are all risk oh. factors that we look, look for uh, <clears throat> when somebody comes into our clinic. I see. Definitely. I see. Now, uh, before we move on to the questions, we are trying to keep the YouTube lives closer to an hour. Uh, I want to address a couple of questions as much as we can. But first, Dr. Lou, you mentioned that you have a book coming up. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> yes, the book uh, will really explain all and more of what I've said during this um, during the show. The the, the uh, title of the book is going to be uh, the Miracle Molecule, and the subtitle is uh, uh, Nitric Oxide and Your Health and Longevity. And the book is is for the layperson, also for someone who is interested in science, to learn more about what nitric oxide is, the properties of nitric oxide, how humans evolved 
to produce nitric oxide, why that happened, why we continue to produce nitric oxide. It also will point out the incredible number of beneficial actions of nitric oxide in the body, not just in preventing cardiovascular disease, but as I talked to you before about uh, maintaining erectile function, about maintaining so many other kinds of functions. And finally, we get into, in the book, ways that people can take to boost their production of NO, to, to, to be sure that you always have a normal, at least a normal amount of nitric oxide. And that focuses on the way you breathe, that focuses on what you eat, what you should not eat, and also physical activity. So that's really what the book is about. It's a more scientific approach to uh, uh, maintaining your health and longevity. Thank you so much, Dr. Lou. And so be aware of whenever that book is coming out, search for Dr. Lou Ignaro Nitric Oxide or Dr. N.O. You will find it like that I, I, as well, I guess. Yes. Um, Chris Linke, he is one of the new YouTube members. Basically, he's saying, is there a point where supplementing with all arginine and citrulline is just too much? Is there a limit? Well, Chris, I think you're doing the right thing because that's exactly what I do. Uh, I, I take arginine and citrulline, now mainly citrulline, uh, every day. But I take citrulline before my big workouts. I used to go to the gym all the time, and I would take um, citrulline maybe an hour, hour and a half before going to the gym. Now, I do a lot of bicycling instead of going to the gym. I live in Southern California, so you know it's a you can have a lot of good cycling days out there even in the winter, although it's been cold lately and raining. Uh, and what I do is I take uh, my citrulline in the morning, but you know on a bicycle you have a water bottle. Guess what? I add a lots mm. of citrulline to the uh, water bottle, so whenever I'm drinking on the ride, I'm drinking citrulline. You asked about toxicity. Um, is there a point where supplementation is just too much? And it's fascinating. For arginine and citrulline, there's almost no known toxicity. In other words, uh, humans have been given up to 30,000 milligrams or 30 grams of arginine with no apparent side effects. And the same thing with citrulline. When you take supplements, you're usually talking about a thousand milligrams or a gram. Personally, I take three grams, that's 3,000 milligrams every day and no toxic effects. Actually, I'm hoping that maybe by taking enough citrulline, I'll start growing some hair back on my head. But that is the <laughs> one effect I've never been able to find for nitric oxide, unfortunately, <clears throat> where uh, I think that uh, both Agus and, uh, and, and Ford take must be taking <laughs> you know, lots of situations. But anyway, I like what you're doing and don't worry about taking too much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lou. And BC, she's in, but, she or he is not a member, but can you guys bring it to Las Vegas to, talking about the event? If the Dallas event goes well, we would love to be at Vegas. So go to the description of the video, prevmedhealthevent.com, get registered, we'll see you in Dallas, and then and probably Vegas. If you do it in Vegas, you can do it just before or after the next Super Bowl which I think oh, is yeah. going to be in Vegas. That was very successful. Yeah. Definitely. Chris, uh, this is more like for you, Dr. Brewer, probably. If, you're at, if you have diabetes, should you do the OGTT still? We do. And the reason for it is um, there's a big, big difference between a diabetic that peaks at 205 versus a, and then is back down at uh, the two-hour and a diabetic that hits 300 at two, one hour and ends up at 350 or 400 at two hours. Now, so the cut point for diabetes is a rather arbitrary 200. So yes, it is helpful. Now, there are people that don't, uh, don't get these um, OGTTs annually or insulin surveys. And most of that is because some of them say, well, look, I already know that I'm diabetic. It's not going to change my lifestyle. 
So, and that's valid. Others can say, you know, I'm, I'm just a carb addict. If I get started on, on that kind of sugar, I'm, I'm down the carb addiction hole for weeks before I can get back out. And for those two, two groups, it really makes sense to not do that annual OGTT. For others, we do recommend it. We do use it because, as I said, uh, diabetes is not just diabetes. There's very significant differences in levels. Thank you so much, Dr. Brewer. And Dr. Liu, uh, I think basically this question is asking, is ADMA, asymmetric dimethylarginine, a uh, marker of supplementation for arginine or citrulline? Let's see. So I'm trying to understand uh, taking citrulline and arginine, which made me itchy or caused heartburn. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of testimonials from people uh, who've taken arginine and citrulline, but I've, I've never seen that, you know, causing itchiness or, or, or causing uh, heartburn. The only thing that side effect arginine might have is in those who are susceptible to getting uh, fever blisters, you know, cold sores on the lips. Mm -hmm. Arginine can make it a little bit worse, mm. uh, but that's, that is pretty rare. It's, doesn't happen too often, but I don't know about causing itchiness or causing heartburn. Should not cause heartburn because these are neutral compounds. They're not acidic. They're not basic. They shouldn't be causing any kind of irritation of the gastrointestinal tract. So should not cause any, any heartburn. Yeah. And the, is, is ADMA testing something that you would recommend? Uh, that's so variable in people. I, I would not, uh, I, I, I personally would not recommend it. I'm not sure what that will, will, uh, uh, tell you, um, taking beetroot juice. Many people take beetroot juice. As I said before, beetroot juice is a root of, it's a root vegetable, uh, extract or juice contains lots of nitrates and nitrites, which can be converted to, uh, nitric oxide. And it's been shown clinically that it in some people at least it improves uh exercise performance uh whether it'll improve adma levels or other cardiovascular measures that's not been shown yet yeah and, and we don't follow adma either no. uh brad uh basically brad is asking uh, if you have a deviated septum Will that decrease the amount of nitric oxide? Do you need to have that fixed because of nitric oxide? No, 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 no. It shouldn't. No, because you still have lots of nasal mucosa. They are still producing uh, uh, nitric oxide. So if you breathe through your nose or close your mouth and breathe through your nose, no problem, I, I would say. Thank you. And a good friend of mine, Paul, he's asking a mouth tape for night sleeping. Will that be helpful? <laughs> well, uh, but I, I don't want to run the risk of doing anything and suggesting anything that could be dangerous. Um, uh, I think that that it can't hurt. Let's put it that way. But, you know, if you have nasal congestion or you have a runny nose or a cold, uh, that's going to be a problem. And you're going to start coughing. That's going to wake you up. Uh, if you have a, you know, if you don't have any, uh, any, any kind of a, a cold issue, flu issue, then I think that taping the mouth uh, couldn't hurt. But I don't think it's, uh, it's necessary. I think that you don't have to breathe through your inhale through your nose every single minute of the day. I think when you're awake, then you can consciously approach it and try to breathe through your nose. It's hard to do that when you're speaking. I mean, I'm speaking and then I breathe through my mouth, you know, and then I'm speaking again. But then there's many quiet periods during the day when I can, you know, breathe through my nose. Uh, when I'm trying to work out, I try to breathe through my, my nose. So I don't think you have to use mouth tape at night. Don't worry about it. Thank you. And you can answer this one if you want. Uh, it's up to you, Dr. Lou. Uh, there's a doc, doc, Dr. Nathan Bryan, and he, sell, he sells a supplement for nitric oxide. Are you 
Are you familiar with it? Would you recommend it or not? I, I know I know Nathan uh, quite well, and um, he is uh, very entrepreneurial. He has a, a lot of different kinds of nitric oxide products. Uh, Nathan Bryan is the one who developed initially uh, those test strips for yeah. a nitric oxide, mm. which I okay. talked about. Um, I think that some of his supplements I have heard are pretty good and, and other ones don't work that well. I must admit, I am not familiar with this particular one, so mm -hmm. I cannot comment. But you look at the label. If, if, if this particular product has uh, arginine or citrulline or both or has nitrate or nitrite or both, I would say that it it's probably will work. But again, I cannot commit myself because I don't know this product. Definitely. And we don't get any money from any of those guys. No, of course not. Uh, Rick Folia, this is a good question. I think a lot of people will like to know your opinion on this. How yeah. is saturated fat decreasing nitric oxide? Okay. Again, I'll start off by saying don't ever eat fat, that kind of fat or lard. Let me explain. It's very simple. These are saturated fats. Okay, I can't get into the chemistry, but saturated fats in the body are oxidized. That means they react with oxygen. And they form a lot of reactive species called free radicals. You can look everything up in the internet that I'm saying. The free radicals combine with nitric oxide, react with nitric oxide to immediately destroy nitric oxide. This is why eating this kind of saturated fat, lard, meats with lots of fats, if you eat them constantly, those people will inevitably get cardiovascular disease due to a deficiency in nitric oxide. So that would be the mechanism. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lou. I have one more question for you, Dr. Brewer. Then I'm, I think I'm going to leave one more for Doc, uh, for Doc, one for Dr. Brewer, one for Dr. Lou, and then we can wrap it up if that, that's okay with you guys. Uh, Dr. Brewer, so Rick is asking, he got a one-year follow-up CIMT. He's disappointed because he did not see any significant changes. Uh, how long he should expect seeing a change on the CIMT? Well, it depends on what kind of change you're looking for. If you're, if you're looking for a reversal of plaque on a CIMT, that's really rare. You know, I've had that there. I've had three other people on the channel uh, document that as well. But the goal is not so much to pull plaque off of, out of that artery wall. The goal is to stabilize it. And everybody can do that. So if Rick is saying, look, I had soft plaque and it's still soft, then that's something, uh, that's a big deal. And that's something I would want to dig a little bit, a lot deeper into. And I'd also be surprised if he's had a massive improvement in his metabolics. Very, very surprised. Um, but again, if it's reversal, totally pulling plaque out, that's not quite, that's, that's not a good goal. So I, I think not progression is the change. Yes. And somebody did make that comment. They said not progressing is a good is a good outcome. Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Lou, I have two two more questions for you. And then I'm sorry. We had a lot of interaction for today's shows. We really appreciate that. But whenever somebody see we a have. video one hour and a half, they're like, oh, I don't want to watch the whole thing. Well, Dr. Dr. Lou was kind enough to provide the answer at the beginning. So uh, Rick Degan, what are the best natural alternatives to ED medications, which sometimes have side effects like headaches, body aches, flushing, vision problems? The best natural alternatives to erectile dysfunction medications. Um, if, if any. Yeah, it, well, I mean, many people who have ED who, who take the drugs that are available don't get these side effects, but I guess uh, some will. Certainly visual issues. I, I realize that because in, in, in many of the people I know with ED who take uh, Viagra, for example, uh, they'll get like a greenish 
tinge to their vision sometimes, you know, when the lights are on. And so I always jokingly tell them that when you take Viagra, turn the lights off and you may not have that, that greenish <laughs> vision. But, no, but I do appreciate the possibility of these side effects. The headaches are probably due to some vasodilation, uh, which is natural because you're increasing NO. And the same thing goes with the flushing reactions, which are due to increased um, you know, capillary blood flow. As far as natural alternatives uh, go, uh, again, it's, it's really hard to say. You know, th there's, no, there's been no proof uh, or clinical testing of supplements or other measures to, uh, that you can ingest, that is, consume uh, to treat ED. But there have been lots of publications showing that increasing your physical activity, even if it's just by walking, ha has improved uh, uh, in many patients their erectile dysfunction. I don't know of anything that you could take as an alternative in terms of medication to do that, but you, by, by em employing more physical activity, that has led to an improvement in some cases. Uh, that's really the best uh, I could do uh, with this. Th this is a, an issue which affects so many men, and it's a, it's a real problem. Uh, not everyone is feels comfortable taking the these kinds of phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and I wish there was more one could do to improve the erectile function. Thank you so much, uh, Please, Dr. Brewer. Go ahead. Let me let me interrupt. Um, Sure. We've gotten some recurring questions, and it's a good it's a good question. I think uh, there's nobody better th to answer that than uh, pharmacologists that with the background you have. Um, the question was, why do we have to take you know for those people that ha those of us that have high blood pressure, why do we ta have to take ACEs and ARBs? Why is there not some sort of anti hypertensive based on nitric oxide? That is a spectacular question. And if you want to work on that and you make a discovery, you too can have the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I'm sure I would. That, that, that is, a, you know, that's a that's natural, a, spectacular question. A gazillion Believe dollar me, question. Drug companies have been working on this forever. <laughs> Nitric oxide is a very, very complex molecule. It's very unstable. It's a gaseous substance. You can't just take nitric oxide. You have to stimulate your body to make nitric oxide. That's the only way you can get that nitric oxide. And, and believe me, companies are looking for drugs that uh, can lower the blood pressure by increasing NO and not causing all these other problems. The one drug, there is one, which I have nothing to do with. I forget the trade name, but there's a drug that has a generic name. It's made by an Italian pharmaceutical company. The name of the pharmaceutical company is Menarini, M-E-N-A-R-I-N-I, -I, Menarini. And they make a drug called, um, uh, let's see, what's it called? Nebivolol. Okay, that's N E. Yeah. B-I-V-O-L-O-L. -O -L. Uh, that is a unique anti-hypertensive drug that actually part of its action is to boost nitric oxide. It's very effective in the elderly because hmm. the elderly can take this anti-hypertensive drug and suffer no side effects. And there have been some reports, some reports that nebivolol is very useful in patients with erectile dysfunction who need an antihypertensive because most antihypertensives interfere with erectile function. This <clears throat> drug apparently does not. That's the best I can do. That's really interesting. And I'm going to go to a, to a little bit less interesting question, but I'm interested on that one when I when the first first time I read it. So fluoride ingesting to water, mouthwash, toothpaste, it is said that it will destroy the oral, oral microbiome and preventing nitric oxide production. Is that, oh, that is, is that, a good is that question. A statement? 
Great that question. Is, that is the one thing I 100% agree with Dr. Nathan Bryan. That was shown by a Swedish group, uh, good friends of mine in Stockholm uh, in the early 2000s. The, um, when you take any kind of a mouthwash, f- fluoride is not going to cause a problem. It's the mouthwashes that cause mm. a problem. The, the antiseptic mouthwashes, because they will destroy, they will prevent the nasal mucosa from producing nitrate and nitrite. Therefore, uh, you don't make any, so when you breathe in even through your nose, you don't get any NO. In addition, in in the oral cavity, you can uh, destroy all of that uh, nitric oxide. So um, I, ever since that was published about 20 years ago, I never use a mouthwash. I brush my teeth, no problem, with fluoride, I don't think that's going to produce an, uh, a detrimental effect, but I do not use mouthwash. What I use instead is water, just plain old water. I gargle with water, swish the water in my mouth, spit it out. Good enough. You don't need that mouthwash. Incredible. Uh, Dr. Lou, Dr. Ford, any closing remarks? Uh, I would say this. Uh, uh, Dr. Ignaro, it's been wonderful having you here. You've been one of our most informative and really fun uh, visitors. I appreciate it. I hope we can get you back sometime. Mm-hmm. I know that it's not like uh, a uh, a Nobel Prize winner has nothing to do but sit around and, <laughs> and wait to, to be interviewed. Uh, it, we've got Take take the time that you'd like. If you've got other stuff you'd like to talk about, please uh, uh, let us know what else you'd like to well, share. I, I just want to make one short comment. I mean, I don't need to have uh, lots of money or another prize for doing podcasts and shows like this. My, you know, my career is uh, nearing a close. I'm 82 years old. I'm still very healthy, believe me. But you know it. We're getting there. And my motivation now, my goal now, is to make nitric oxide a household word. Okay? I always tell people, every five and six-year-old and seven-year-old has heard of Viagra. But 99% of the population of adults has never heard of nitric oxide. Mm. What is wrong with that picture? (laughs) <laughs> so I'm trying to promote nitric oxide so that everyone understands NO. It would be so great if I could walk out into the street and people are talking about, well, have you increased your NO lately? What have you done to boost your NO? Are you eating to boost your NO? Uh, are you walking every day to boost your NO and prevent yourself from getting cardiovascular disease? This is all I want to do for the, my remaining years is to talk to people like you and convince you that nitric oxide is very, very important to your health and longevity. And I don't make a dime from doing any of this. Perfect. Thank you so, so much. And, and Dr. Ignaro, something I neglected to ask you, please please stay with us for a few minutes before we close the show. Okay. And for you viewers, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a spectacular talk. And it's not just because I'm saying it, uh, Dr. Ignaro, you were a fantastic guest. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you did good, Dr. Brewer. And we'll see you we'll see me next okay. week. Next week, we're having Dr. Omara. So stay tuned with us. Thank you so much. Sean and Omara, the, the guy Sean that's Omara. done all the abdominal MRIs for presidents and says the best way to improve that that abdominal belly fat is hill sprints. Hey. <laughs> well, we're digressing again, Dr. Brewer. That's for next week. <laughs> so Just wanted to get a little, uh, a little yeah, tag okay. in there for it. Oh yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. You're well, the you're the new the new big show editor. You should know that. Well, <laughs> Doctor Burr, <laughs> do your thing. Wrap it up. See you next week. Thanks for your interest. <laughs>